Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Revenue Imperative, Meet the New Revenue-Driven Marketer. I'm your moderator, Megan Lockwood. I'm the head of content at eDynamic, and I'm really thrilled to be joined today by our president, Warren Raich. Warren is himself a revenue marketer that has worked on the client side with leading companies like Apple, 3Com, Gateway, HP, and Adobe divisions, as well as digital agencies developing and executing revenue-driven revenue -driven marketing for some of the world's leading brands. In today's presentation, we're going to examine this new revenue imperative for marketers and provide real-time examples on how you can create measurable revenue performance and drive new customers to your business. We'll also have a question and answer session at the end, so please send us your questions and we'll make sure that we answer them immediately in real time. So now I should introduce Warren, our president, I'm thrilled to have you today. How are you? Good, Megan. Thank you so much for, uh, for working with me on this today. It's an exciting topic. Uh, there's a lot of buzz about it going on in the industry, so let's just roll up our sleeves and dive in. Sounds good. There, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's, if you search on uh, revenue marketing or revenue-driven marketing, you'll see lots of results. There's research being going on. There's a lot of social buzz about it. It is a major transformative event that's going on in the industry. Um, and I referenced some of these uh, data points uh, throughout my presentation, so uh, thank you for other thought leaders that are kind of stepping up and uh, getting points of view out there as well. There's a uh, four-part series that we're launching starting today. Uh, the Revenue Imperative and Meet the Revenue Driven Marketer is uh, series one. Today is about the big picture of this revenue marketing transformation that's going on. We're going to focus today on how to set your marketing revenue strategy, how to build a roadmap, uh, key trends, uh, cultural shifts that are going to be required uh, within your organization, as well as operational shifts uh, and opportunities that are present, presented with this change as well. So that's the focus of today. And then as we move into uh, parts two, three, and four, we're going to focus more on how to build a, uh, a marketing measurement framework. A lot of the success or failure of moving into a revenue-driven marketing model really is going to be hinged on how well you measure uh, uh, and build a framework for accountability. So we'll have a session that goes deep into uh, how to do that for your organization as well. Um, the third area we're going to dive into in a separate session is the Revenue Marketing Engine Platform. And this is where we get into the, the nuts and bolts of the technology infrastructure that is required to really empower marketers today with um, things like marketing automation and integrations with your CRM and your CMS systems, things like that. So, We'll put a fine point on it then as to, you know, what are the core requirements needed to, to build out a revenue uh, engine for your, uh, your marketing department and uh, what that framework uh, constitutes. Um, we're also going to be moving into the final series, which will be the automated marketing revenue engine. And here we talk about taking the, the latest and greatest marketing automation technologies and layering that on top of the platform so that you can reach, you know, not only, uh, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands, but even millions of customers in a highly personalized, automated way. So these are the four key parts. We'll be joined by uh, a number of key partners that we work with as well that will be kind of guest speaking with us over the weeks. So uh, just check back in often and you'll, you'll see the announcements on the next series. So the big question really is, you know, why become a revenue-driven marketer? You know, life is good. You just figured out, you know, how to get your... Uh, your marketing job, you know, well defined. Uh, you've got all of your activities tracked. Uh, you know, everything seems to be going along well. Uh, let me give you a little bit of indication from a market, you know, perspective of what's happening, so uh, you can understand why this is uh, a, such a strong point that we're calling it the revenue imperative. Here's the big picture: roughly 50% of all B2B marketers currently have direct revenue accountability as part of their job description. So. It is no longer a, a nice to have uh, for half of your your counterparts. It's a must have. The CMO and the C-suite are basically demanding this shift. It's uh, it's being driven by a number of major things. Obviously, the you know the economic uh, downturn uh, globally. You know, people started watching every penny. They want accountability on the dollars they're spending. Um, I think the digital wave also kind of influenced this, where people were you know used to doing things on an impression. Uh, Know, event based activity based model and with digital the promise was you know everything is measurable and accountable 
So it created a new uh, a new bar, if you will, uh, that was raised for marketers to say, okay, let's start measuring effectiveness and impact of the uh, the marketing dollars that we're spending. So we're now seeing that effect uh, hitting uh, front and center in the marketing world. Well, and also every every click and track and piece that we you know every interaction we have online is being tracked now, so we can. Exactly. It's now possible. Exactly. Before you could, you know, say, hey, I can only get impression data or, uh, you know, circulation data on uh, on publications for print ads, things like that. So, you, you know, we, we dealt with what we had. Now we right. have such a depth of information available to us, uh, kind of driving this whole big data movement that's going on. So, yes, good point, Megan. Basically, uh, B2B marketers are uh, reaching prospects earlier in the life cycle as well. You know, given the uh, the digital reach that we have now, and the fact that uh, marketers are basically getting involved early and they're staying involved longer through the sales cycle and even in the post-sales cycle, um, it's really putting more of a uh, a revenue imperative on the marketing organization because of that uh, that longer engagement cycle. It's no longer just you know capture a qualified lead, pass it over to sales, and then move on. Um, marketing is playing a critical role throughout the uh, the life cycle, and you know the key, the old adage: you manage what you measure. So if you don't measure it, you really have a hard time managing uh, effectiveness. B two B marketers are now expected to, uh, you know, uh, basically undergo one of the most radical uh, and fast changes in history from a from a job description point of view, and this you know one of one of the byproducts of the digital revolution, I think. So just the speed and the velocity of change that's going on right now is calling for a new kind of marketer to be uh, either grown, you either decide to actually you know, train yourself and move into this new area, or the reality is that somebody else will. There's a whole new generation of digitally savvy, uh, revenue aware uh, marketers that are coming down the pike. So the imperative is very real. Marketers in general are under pressure to produce more and more content and activities with a growing pressure to drive revenue. So, uh, you know, we're not off the hook really on uh, our activity load. In fact, if anything, it's actually gotten more complex and more demanding. Uh, marketing transformation is underway. Uh, we're basically moving, like I said, from, uh, from lead generation through the pre-sales and post-sales cycles. Um, and we need metrics to kind of track and demonstrate the value uh, that we're bringing to the company from a revenue impact point of view to the C-suite. So marketers today, as I mentioned, have a lot on their shoulders. Marketers must measure uh, programs across channels and across multiple device types. Big data is a, uh, a looming opportunity and, uh, and also a, a point of chaos and confusion for many of us. Um, if you ask you know, five people in a room what big data means to them, you'll probably get at least five answers. Um, so, you know, transforming that, that big data promise, if you will, into actionable insights is really the task at hand this year is just let's grab the information we can to personalize experiences to, uh, you know, give people information on the devices they want, when they want, how they want it, that sort of thing. So big data can be put into smaller lenses and smaller chunks that we can uh, uh, take actionable insights on and, to, and start building into our marketing uh, this week. Is that there's immediate value to big data if we don't get lost in the, the terminology and the, uh, just the sheer magnitude of it. Um, revenue metrics are trumping activity metrics. Uh, we'll talk about that a little further later, but they are uh, you know, clearly getting the uh, C-suite to lean in on the table and look at uh, uh, revenue impact. And marketing technologies are critical components to the success of all this. Um, you know, the, the good news is you're not alone. You've got technology companies and people that are behind you that actually can automate a lot of this. So we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. So there, are, there is a promise in the technology uh, underpinnings of marketing today. The big uh, shift really, of course, is marketing moving from a cost center to a revenue center. Massive shift. Uh, redefining marketing's role within an organization. Um, obviously, you know, we, we measured historically on, you know, how many trade shows did we do, how many print pieces did we get out, how many advertisements did we place, and, you know, we tracked, uh, you know, down to the click level on what happened on those. But now the, uh, the imperative really is to transform the entire organization into a revenue center. So big implications, as you might imagine. 
Um, so my advice to you personally is if you want to secure your position and you want to influence, you know, incre increase your influence and power within your organization, tie yourself to a revenue number. It's, it's very scary, I know, and uh, I've, I've made a career moving between sales and marketing organizations, and I just can tell you from personal experience, uh, you know, ultimately you're going to be responsible anyway, and that's probably one of the reasons why, you know, the CMO slot is, you know, rotated every two, you know 18 months to two years you know whether they acknowledge it or not there's there's always been an <laughs> underlying reality right so you're being judged on a number anyway so you may as well know what that number is and control it exactly exactly own it embrace it you know uh, you know enjoy the change it, it, it actually is very refreshing to be able to walk into a, a board meeting or a c-level meeting and say you know we move the uh, needle on revenue so let's take a look here. It's, a, it's time to redefine your relationships with sales. That's one of the big messages I want to share with you today as well. Um, the historic, traditional uh, relationship with sales uh, has been, you know, we'll give you qualified leads and you guys take it from there. Um, that's changed, as I mentioned. Ago. Basically, you have to basically stay involved throughout the entire cycle right now and, you know, really be a, a, a content uh, producer, a uh, nurturer, a... Uh, you know, a retention arm for the company. And once again, these have always been assets and, and uh, activities that you, you've, you're comfortable with doing, but right now with the revenue lens on it, it really calls for a kind of a refresh, if you will, of the expectations from a SLA, a service level agreement basically between uh, organizations. And it doesn't stop at sales. It really also goes to marketing, finance, and IT, because everybody's got a seat at the table um, in this negotiation. I think it's interesting, Warren, I was telling you, I think, a couple weeks ago that we at my last firm actually had an API that linked our, um, our marketing technology tools with Salesforce, and we had an SLA, we had a dollar value where we owed the sales team X number of leads every single month, and it was, you know, like a big number, $60,000 worth of leads, and we got there a couple different ways, but we mm had -hmm. a, we had a, um, a spreadsheet that was literally mailed to us at midnight every single night where we knew every single day of the month how were we holding up how we were holding up against that number so mm -hmm. months we were behind we would you know we would pull out all the guns in the last two weeks to make sure that we hit that number because we held our it was very serious we held ourselves accountable to it but months that we were ahead a little bit we had something that hit that went well we could set mm -hmm. ourselves up for next month so I, I find that that visibility really changed the way that we did marketing, too. Love that story. That is exactly right. You're ahead of your time. Uh, I think that's great. <laughs> you know, another uh, mantra that I'm fond of saying is people do what they're paid to do or, you know, do what they're comp to do. So I think another alignment that needs to be done is aligning people's compensation with their behavior, you know, which will drive their behavior. So if people are comped on doing, uh, you know, revenue-moving activities, then uh, that's what they'll do with their days. So it's that simple. So you've got to align, you know, your relationships with uh, sales, finance, IT, and marketing, kind of all getting on a unified uh, set of objectives. And then you've got to empower and uh, hold your team accountable through, and then, you know, and then compensate them accordingly. So these are all, uh, you know, great areas to kind of dive into. Um, but necessary to start thinking about uh, this year. The new revenue-oriented roles are, are emerging all over the place. Um, and basically, you know, if you want to solidify your, uh, your role in this new area, create a new title for yourself. Uh, and there's, there's some out there that you can kind of go to LinkedIn and start searching on. You'll see like Chief Revenue Officer is a, becoming a common uh, title, VP of Revenue Marketing, Director of Revenue, uh, Centers of Excellence. So, uh, there's a number of these uh, emerging titles and roles within a company that are now starting to uh, proliferate uh, across organizations. So, you know, find one that you're comfortable with in, within your organization and uh, you can build your title and maybe your department uh, functions around that as well. So one of the big things you, you know, we, we were all familiar with as marketers is the customer journey. Um, if we put the lens on this of, you know, revenue now, there was a recent study done by uh, Lookbook, Oracle, uh, and the Eloqua division, and they basically were looking at, uh, you know, how, how marketing uh, teams are using uh, marketing automation and how they're tracking their success. <clears throat> One of the key takeaways here is only 12% of marketers feel that they ha are sophisticated in their alignment of measurement of content to results. Um, and if you, you put a finer point on that even from uh, revenue results. So, 
it's uh, it's it's a big opportunity for improvement. I guess is one way to look at this. Uh, there's a lot of people that just really don't feel like they've uh, reached the sophistication level they need to. So uh, the good news or bad news is you're not alone. There's a lot of us, uh, you know, in the trenches working through these issues right now. So it's very topical, and uh, you know, it, it does seem to be a general concern within the marketing ranks. Another I don't know. I mean, I think that there's an. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, I, I think you learn every day too. I think this is iterative, and so it, when you come from a content marketing standpoint, I think you try something and you go, "Oh, that worked," and then three months later, it didn't work quite as well. So I think mm -hmm. that because customers are always changing and the web is fluid, I think understanding some of these pieces and why content works is a constantly improving battle or lesson. Yeah, absolutely, test and learn, test and learn, and then repeat. Um, <clears throat> this data point talks about is is kind of around that activity base uh, that we looked at. Like you know, what is working nowadays? And you know, a lot of the tried and true things we've been doing for years are are effective. White papers and ebooks, webinars, uh, videos are uh, you know really a rising uh, uh, engagement uh, tool. Case studies. Th these kind of things are are uh, are huge players on it. The point that I wanted to add on this one was that we need to start now putting the revenue lens on this as well. So it's not just about did they download the white paper and we put a checkbox next to that and say, okay, we had so many downloads. That's a great success metric. But you know, following them post uh, download, did they, you know, were they re reached out to? Did they answer a, uh, you know, they fall into our nurturing program? And did they ultimately end up getting a call from uh, inside sales? And you know, kind of following them through that journey, uh, if you will. Uh, then we'll ultimately find out if downloading a white paper actually did move the needle on uh, on revenue or not. Otherwise, we look at these stats, and it can be deceiving because we, you know, looking at this at first glance, I could say, okay, white papers and eBooks, you know, uh, high performing, you know, activity. But you know, if it really never resonates, uh, uh, you know, or moves the needle on revenue, then uh, we may have been better going down to you know infographics or presentations on SlideShare. So you know those those are the that's the kind of peeling of the end of the onion that I think we need to start doing as marketers now to really see where is the revenue impact of these activities besides the uh, tracking of actions. Another key point from this research report: only thirty seven percent of modern marketers track beyond the click. So to my earlier point, uh, <clears throat> tracking time uh, with the audience on the content is great. You know, people are coming, they're reading our blog, they're downloading our white papers, that sort of thing. But tracking beyond that click is uh, is really the, the key message that we have to drive home here. Uh, follow follow the flow all the way through. Another key point here, 51% uh, of modern marketers are producing content for sales. So they are doing this in the, uh, in the vein of sales enablement. They're uh, number one, obviously, they're looking for lead generation. So it's a great metric. And, Absolutely critical role of the marketing organization is to have qualified lead flow, um, and then you know have that nurturing program followed by you know increased brand awareness and sales enablement and channel partner and bar education. That's really these are all critical roles, um, but once again, got to add that other layer of tracking to revenue impact. Another thing that people there is an overwhelming uh, need for mass production of content right now, and a lot of people are turning to uh, third-party agencies uh, for this. Um, you know, there there's still a lot of core stuff that's being produced in-house, but about 47 percent of uh, of the polled uh, re polled people in the research basically said that they do use outsourced third parties uh, for producing the content, and then 21 percent use third parties for curating the content. Uh, Obviously, uh, you know, Megan, you're great at this. You know, you really help us think through. Um, you know, how do you take a, a, a robust piece of content and break it into different nuggets? You know, what's the piece that should be on SlideShare, and what's the piece that should be turned into a blog post? And, you know, what can be, uh, you know, a LinkedIn uh, post and things like that. So, having various uh, curation of content, it, I think, is a really important aspect and. Uh, also an interesting data point to see what moves the needle. Uh, Megan, you shared with us a week or so back some research about how people really just kind of scan data now. And uh, yeah, so you know, tell, tell, tell us a little bit about that and how you what your point of view in, uh, is on this. Well, I mean, I think a couple different things come into play in here in terms of in-house in content because really there are certain things you shouldn't outsource, sort of like brain surgery and the thought leadership you have internally what you actually know 
that's your competitive advantage. The people, your material, the you know, the thought leadership, the strategic differentiation is really your internal resources. So I, I think sometimes I've tried to interview it out of people or something like that. So sit down with an expert and because they're not always writers. Somebody who's really great at one thing, it's often not writing about what they do or explaining it to someone else. But you can find writers to interview it or, you know, get a list, look at the tools that people use every day and figure out how to write a story around that. But I do think that it has to start from what you know and what you're great at. But to your point, then make that do as many different double and triple and quadruple duties as possible. So take a tactical tool and make a checklist out of it and make a blog post out of it and make an infographic out of it. And that way you won't be just running around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to produce and produce and produce content. The, the other piece, though, that is critically important is what you call it, so the title. I know that there was something, uh, the, the piece I saw the other day was on, um, apparently we're under emergency, the piece I saw the other day was on uh, headlines and sharing in Twitter, and there's some fascinating piece about the fact that a third more shares happen on Twitter than actually click-throughs. So when you talk about engagement, when you look at statistics, people are sharing things that they've never read to make themselves look smart or to um, because it, it seems like the title matters. So taking that time to make sure that you framed or packaged your material is almost as critically important as actually taking the time to write the material. Mm -hmm. So knowing why people are clicking on your, your pieces, that's really important for this. Oh, that's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. I, we, we love your point of view and how you frame those things for us as well. So thank you. So content marketing, uh, you know, basically is, is people have been looking at kind of quantitative metrics for, for a while, you know, how many clicks, how many, uh, you know, calls to actions were, uh, were acted upon, things like that, which I, which I agree is, is, a, is a great way to look at things. But, um, you know, I think the, uh, we just have to, have to kind of be metrics hounds and Follow these things through uh, at a deeper level beyond the uh, beyond the click and you know even beyond the call to action. So um, these are some of the areas that are pretty typical in the uh, in the marketing rank, ranks right now. So uh, you know it's it's good that we are becoming much more metrics driven marketers. I think that is a, a general trend as well. So uh, keep going on that path and uh, you know keep keep moving uh, towards revenue uh, measurement as well. So let's talk a little bit about developing your revenue marketing success framework. So how do you do this? Uh, let's, let's look at this. There's an eight-point uh, model that basically I'll walk you through real quick. And you know, basically we uh, we look at defining your strategy, you know, aligning with your C-suite uh, as well as your other uh, departments in the company, sales, finance, and IT specifically. Defining the marketing skills that are required to actually become marketing-driven. Uh, I mean, uh, revenue-driven marketers, uh, conducting revenue readiness audits, uh, determining where to fill the gaps. You have choices. You can either hire, you can train yourself uh, and your team, or you can outsource to an agency or third party. Um, building your revenue marketing roadmap. I think it's important that everybody has a common roadmap uh, that they, they work towards. Um, building your revenue marketing platform, and this is around the technology choices you make, and then measuring uh, absolutely everything you do towards the revenue results. So this, this eight-step process basically will get you into a, uh, a solid readiness mode for becoming a uh, revenue-driven marketer. So developing your strategy. Number one point that I'd have here is start at the top. Uh, exec, uh, executive support is absolutely critical for the long-term success of this. And the reason that I say this is, first of all, first-hand experience of doing it right and wrong over the years, so uh, there's, there's some learnings in here, but um, uh, most importantly, it's because you as a marketer are sitting with your set of activities and tasks and measurements, and it's all well and good, but you probably don't have as much influence over the CIO or the CTO or the uh, CFO um, or the head of sales. So the only way to get uh, you know that buy-in and uh, alignment is to actually have executive C-level support basically mandating it across the company that this is a new way of doing business and it's great for the company. It's going to forge all kinds of new uh, uh, positive partnerships across the uh, organization um, and you know it's, it's going to work. 
Um, I guess the only caveat to this strategy I would give you guys is you might want to do a little quiet in the corner kind of testing of your revenue ability to you know track revenue and move the needle on it on uh, some uh, kind of low lower uh, visibility parts of your marketing activities so you kind of have a model worked out you figure out how ready your team is uh, to do this because once you open this box the uh, the accountability is going to be much larger on your shoulders so I would say you know even though I say start at the top I would say do a pre start within your own department, get yourself organized and ready, uh, test it a little bit with some campaigns and see how you can follow it through uh, through a revenue model and then kind of uh, go in boldly to the C-suite and say, you know, here's where I think we want to go with the company. It's going to take some time and some movement and some retraining and staffing and all that, but, you know, we've done some testing and here's how we can uh, demonstrate what we've, what, we've, uh, what we've learned. The other areas I would talk about is, you know, just have an honest assessment with you you and your team. You know, what are you ready, willing, and able to do? Um, some of these are big changes I'm talking about, and, uh, you know, we're talking about with Megan today. And it's, uh, you know, you've got to assess your own willingness to take a deep breath and say, yeah, we're going to do this. Uh, what is your vision of the future? You know, it's, uh, you know, if you have a future state that you can articulate very crisp and clear, I think that helps everybody else get on your page, same page of your vision. Um, and then a, a clear assessment of what you need to get there, and then who, who and what will need to change in your organization to make it happen, and who's going to be accountable. So these are some of the key questions that I start asking uh, yourself, your team, and your uh, counterparts in the organization to just get a, a sense of uh, readiness and willingness. Um, and I think there's a piece about you know knowing what Nirvana looks like, and then trying to figure out okay, given that, how do we get as close to that with spit and duct tape as possible? Exactly, and, and don't try to boil the ocean right away. It's going to be an iterative process. There is no way humanly possible to transform your organization overnight. You know, you're going to have to baby step this a little bit. But as long as everybody has a common uh, you know vision of where they're going, I think it'll it'll be a wonderful journey. But uh, yeah, just uh, just don't overset expectations. It's always better to you know set expectations low and overachieve. So um, you know, once again, and, and this point here, basically, transformation comes from across the organization. Not just, it's not just your burden. Uh, you guys have to share the load with sales, finance, the delivery side of your house, product uh, teams, all that. So it's it's a shared commitment and a shared vision. Uh, another key point, you know, engage key stakeholders from across the organization to buy in, not only the executives, but once you get the executive buy-in, then you, you're really going to have to operationalize this down to, you know, individual contributors, uh, uh, starting with the, the tasks, the, uh, you know, balanced scorecards you put in place, the compensation models you put in place. There's, there's some pretty deep issues you got to think through, but um, engage them in the conversation. It's always better if people buy into a vision than basically have it handed to them and just told to do it. So uh, you're going to have to become an evangelist a little bit for a while to, to get a uh, total corporate buy-in on this. Develop excitement uh, and get commitments. Uh, one way I've done this across organizations before is to uh, give it a name. You know, let people know that you're doing uh, some kind of transformative thing in the company and brand it. You know, you guys are marketers, so you get this. Uh, Everything you do, call it an internal program, give it a name, you know, and give it some kind of a visionary name, you know, call it, uh, you know, Vision 2020 or something like that, and you guys are heading this way over the next, you know, number of years. So it just, you can, you can get some fun and excitement and energy around it, you know, make t-shirts, whatever, you know, but uh, it can be a fun transformative event uh, if, we, if you take the right frame on it. Uh, define your joint goals, objectives, and create a unified strategy. Once again, if you've got one side of the shop doing one thing and you're doing another, it's never going to work. You've got to have unified uh, objectives and goals. And then my final point here is become a marketing revenue champion within your company. It can be a great career builder or, uh, or you could crash and burn. It's a risk, but you know, I would say I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. So I would say you know, basically oh, if you're going to own it anyway, you might as well embrace it you know, and have fun with it and become an internal champion within your company. Next step is de defining and developing alignment across the enterprise. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the strongest unifying message in any for-profit company is revenue. You know, it's it's clearly understood. It kind of cuts right to the chase of whether it's working or not. There's no abstract thinking about it. 
it's either working or it's not. You know, I mean, the uh, when you talk about branding or messaging or things like that, there's some gray area in whether you know uh, whether it's working or not. When you talk about revenue, it's either moving the needle or it's not. And uh, to your point earlier, Megan, you can track it on a day by day basis. So it is yeah. it is the ultimate ultimate unifying message of a company is are we driving revenue? You know, so yeah. uh, tie yourself to that. Defining ownership and expectations and accountability models, uh, absolutely critical. Back to our kind of SLA discussion, um, you've got to look at the very minimum across these organizations, marketing, IT, whatever the delivery is on your company, uh, whether you're a product company or a service company, there's always some kind of delivery aspect, finance and sales. So at the very minimum, you've got to have unified uh, vision, expectations, and accountability models for each of these so that you're all clear on who's doing what and uh, at what time frame so you know you can you can clearly have a well-oiled machine here. You know, when I was thinking about this, when you look at it, do you think that there should be one person who's ultimately accountable or do you well, think that there it's a team effort? What is ultimately it's a team effort you know but I do think there the buck has to stop somewhere so I think you know the CMO ultimately has to own it on the marketing side, the CTO at the IT level. You know, so I, I do think there has to be one executive owner sponsor uh, in each of these buckets, and then he or she has to kind of define the accountability model downstream, uh, you know, into the uh, you know the balance scorecards and the comp models and you know uh, all those things that they basically have to run from a departmental effectiveness point of view. So the the buck does stop I think at the uh, at the leadership level, but you know it is a shared accountability model ultimately because it's it's transformative in many ways. People have to start tracking these, get used to looking at those spreadsheets every night and you know seeing if what they're they're doing is working. I think one thing that uh, corporations have learned over the years is, you know, uh, there's there's very little patience anymore. You know, with the advancement of digital, everybody wants things done now, um, and a lot of that's unrealistic. But it it's the world we live in. So um, I think getting people used to just getting these metrics uh, as part of their their daily lives is probably a a good thing. So defining your organization's revenue marketing skills. This is a another big area of, uh, of attention. I think we, people need to put on this. So you, you need to conduct what we call a um, you know an audit, basically a skill audit of your marketing, sales, finance, delivery, and IT team to basically say how how ready are we? Do we have somebody that fits this kind of job description that can even have the ability to track these kind of uh, metrics, report on them, and actually have some yield, some kind of level of influence in each of our departments to actually change things so you know there's uh, there's various roles and responsibilities that are going to be uh, impacted so doing a, a skill assessment across your company would be another step that I'd recommend you do uh, as part of this process and then you know obviously what will come out of that is a gap analysis and you'll be able to then determine you know how you fill that gap uh, it'll either be in um, you know training uh, hiring somebody new or using an outsource partner for those elements it'll fall in one of those three buckets Aligning marketing with the buyer's journey, we talked about this a little earlier, nearly half of modern marketers are learning how to align content with the buyer journey. So this, uh, you know, once again is a uh, just kind of a, a, a point on how, what skill sets are needed now to kind of align across all these areas. The, uh, you know, building a revenue marketing team, that's uh, it's basically there's a four phase uh, customer journey that uh, Forrester put out that might give us a good lens to start thinking about this because it can be a little daunting when you first start to try to think it through. So if we break it into these uh, buckets of, you know, how customers interact with us, because you know obviously customers are still king. There are you know, they pay for all of our uh, our uh, our livelihoods. So uh, you know, look at the journey that they go through, and if we can break it into these four uh, areas, we might be able to have more tactical tasks and skill requirements called out. So discovery, uh, exploration, buying, and engagement um, are good ways to kind of look at it. And the way Forrester called it out was to basically have a set of tasks that you could fill in um, around your you know, ambitions of what you can do to actually move the needle. So if you, if you look at this framework, they didn't write it specifically for the revenue imperative, but I found it to be kind of an interesting uh, you know, uh, worksheet to kind of use for that purpose. You could actually use it 
and basically, okay, see so during the discovery phase, how you know what tasks can we do while they're you know in the explore phase or buy or engage phase? What are the tasks we can do? And then you'll ultimately have your own kind of populated uh, version of, of activities that you can do in each of these areas. So it's a simple four-step you know uh, you know set of uh, you know buckets that we can actually look at. You can create your own. This was just one that I thought might be representative of uh, uh, one way to kind of go through thinking through the process. Develop your rev revenue marketing roadmap. So obviously there's going to be a roadmap to this. It's going to be an iterative process to get there. So how do we build this roadmap? So um, you know a roadmap is basically you know you can look at it from multiple ways. It can be your you know uh, your, your change management roadmap throughout your organization. It can be a customer roadmap, you know, how do you engage with the customer and track that back to revenue. So there's different ways that we could tackle this, um, but, you know, this, I'll just give kind of an exploratory uh, one uh, here of how it could potentially be mapped out. Uh, there's a uh, gentleman named uh, Rick McPartin that did a, uh, he does a uh, blog called CMO Challenge, and he, he put a, uh, an interesting lens together, so I'm, uh, you know, thankful to Rick for this. I'm going to borrow it for uh, demonstration purposes today. Basically, he looked at, you know, the... Uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Standing on the shoulders of giants, giants exactly. So uh, the marketing uh, buckets here are all in gold. Sales are in blue and the delivery boxes are in red. So this gives you a little bit of idea as far as putting an accountability and a, uh, an action model together of, you know, who, who deals with the suspects and lead generation, you know, who deals with, you know, calling the, uh, the qualified leads and, you know, who deals with delivering to the customer and that sort of thing. So. This is really representative, but you know, you guys might use uh, you know, other visuals, or you might just spreadsheet into a workbook. You know, whatever works for you guys. Every culture is a little bit different. Some people live in PowerPoint, so uh, you know, you got to kind of tune into your own culture of, you know, what that roadmap would look like. But the functional boxes here are the important point. Really, is you know, follow the customer journey, find out who's literally responsible, accountable, and has the list of actions to do at each of the customer journey points. So seven key facts that Rick shared basically was, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a revenue roadmap for every uh, completed sales transaction. So if you could, you know, kind of look at this from that revenue lens. Uh, if the company doesn't create the roadmap, uh, salespeople will create their own, and that could be good or bad, but it, probably more bad because you'll have, you know, 20 different versions of this because uh, that's just how they work and uh, you know everybody will, everybody will put their own spin on it so a consistent unified flow of responsibility and accountability I think is important with custom roadmaps the sales team ends up doing a lot of the work uh, as you mentioned here in gold blue and red you, you do end up um, having the risk of having your most expensive uh, resources in the company percent of salespeople still generate their own leads. That means that they're actually sifting through LinkedIn, they're going through uh, data sources they can find, they're searching around on InfoSeq, they're doing all the work that you could probably get just, you know, a full-time data miner to do for them and populate it and then sift it through to the, the highest quality leads. And, you know, there, there's a process, obviously, that we can follow that's much more intelligent than having a, a high-paid, uh, you know, person basically doing, you know, something that maybe they're not even good at, to be honest. You know, they're, they're stumbling around doing it because the reason they're doing it is because they have to. You know, they're not getting what they want out of marketing, so they're picking up the, uh, the ball and doing it themselves. Not efficient. That statistic hurts my heart a little bit. Does it? Yeah, it's yeah. true. <laughs> it does. As a marketer, I get it. It's like, yeah, but it's, it's the reality. Um, so what are, what are the key takeouts here? Let's see. Uh, basically, you know, if you want, you know, a, a well-oiled lead machine, you, you've got to get some process and ownership back in place. Um, so um, I think another key point, in a matter of time, I won't go through everyone, but basically the bottom line of what he's saying is products and services don't sell themselves. So you've got to put a machine in place. Let, let play to people's strengths. Let marketing do what they do well. Let uh, inside sales do what they do well. Let the sales team do what they do well. And uh, let's all complement each other's skill sets. Building your revenue engine platform. Uh, this is an interesting kind of thing that's coming up as another Uber trend, but there's a new role uh, called marketing technologists that are starting to emerge, and you guys could pretty much guess why. Um, it's very hard to be a marketer nowadays without having a, uh, 
a geek side or at least a geek along your side. And uh, uh, if you look at a LinkedIn search uh, that we recently did, we showed 51,000 results of people with variations of this title. So it, it's an emerging area of uh, basically uh, using empowering uh, marketing technologies to get your job done. Uh, it's quickly taking, I would say, equal or center stage with the, uh, the revenue marketing uh, title as well. I think it's probably ahead of the curve actually on revenue marketers. But, um, so it's just a reality and I think we all just have to kind of embrace it. So uh, these, are, these are new roles that are being defined in the marketing ranks and uh, you can either own them, embrace them, become one of them or, uh, you know, or maybe be replaced by one of them. So uh, you know, we, we have choices in life. So the revenue engine elements, um, if you look at this list, um, you know, I like to look at it from you know, kind of a demand perspective. Uh, key marketing revenue engine components include holistic integration of the following elements. So this is like a laundry list of things. Basically at the very top of the list, of course, is a tried and true method we've all been using for years, email marketing systems. You know, 88% of, uh, of the, the respondents basically are saying that that's you know, their number one uh, tool they're using right now for uh, driving revenue. Um, CRM, uh, Salesforce Automation, 86%. Uh, Web analytics, so to my point earlier, you can measure it like crazy. So become a metrics hound, just build it into how you do your business. Marketing automation overall um, is a, a rising area. Um, marketing analytics as a specific subset, um, also on the rise. Content marketing, uh, if you look at all the radical changes going on in search engine marketing, uh, it's SEO, you know, it basically the, uh, the bottom line is that content is uh, king and you know, how we slice it and dice it and uh, distribute it and treat, you know, be all become media producers in one form or fashion or another uh, is a critical area. And then marketing asset management becomes a, uh, a key component of your platform as well as you have to have multiple uh, contents in different format and different device types and all that. Where do you put all this stuff? So there has to be a clear workflow process for uh, uh, marketing uh, content authoring and check-in process and approvals and keeping on the latest revs and all that. It becomes a nightmare if you don't have an, uh, a good uh, marketing asset management system. And then the ultimate Uber area, which is it's the smallest area here, but I think it's got the most promise, which is predictive analytics, which basically allows you to take all the learnings that you have from all of your uh, technologies listed above and start being predictive and uh, responsive to your clients and anticipating what they're looking for based by based on their behavior, based on their registered, uh, you know, if you have the registered information, you can look at their historical buying data, things like that. So you can have a much more one-to-one -one marketing um, uh, relationship. So even though it's the smallest on the uh, chart here, it's probably got the biggest potential for what many of us in marketing want to do, which is, you know, ultimately get a one-to-one -one marketing uh, uh, engagement going with our clients. So through the use of technology, uh, predictive analytics is one of the key areas that will help us get there. This is a, um, a marketing, uh, a customer experience maturity model. Uh, this one I actually uh, stole from uh, Sitecore. They basically uh, did an analysis of, uh, you know, people moving through the attract, convert, and, you know, activate uh, model of, a, of the life cycle. So you can, you can build your own, you know, kind of maturity model as to where you guys are, you can look through these kind of things and figure out okay, where are we in the maturity model from a customer experience point of view. Customer experience management is a uh, another Uber trend, I would say, um, among uh, marketers and among technology folks. They're trying to empower personalized customer experiences across multiple devices, multiple times a day, multiple um, interfaces. So um, it's really a uh, a big area. So it's a it's a mindset as well as a uh, you know, a delivery model for you guys to think about is, you know, how do we deliver great, uh, you know, delighted customer experiences, um, and where are we in the maturity model of actually delivering on that? Does your organization have a, re a revenue metrics mindset? Some do, some don't. Uh, to your point earlier, Megan, your organization obviously did. They put some uh, uh, real tactical uh, elements in place. So uh, my... Well... Go ahead. No, I think that it's one of those things where whether you think your organization cares about revenue or not, I bet if you talk to your C-suite, it does. So, uh, you know, I think everyone does. You just may not know it. Exactly. So better to put a spotlight on it, you know. 
I would, I think that, you know, I've mentioned this a few times, but activity-based metrics such as impressions, opens, click-through rates, they're not going to go away. It's not like these are going to be passe. They're still very important. They're at the top of the funnel. It's where things are happening. So it, it is the, your early indicator on interest. So absolutely embrace those, keep going with those. But then now you've got to layer in these additional sales revenue metrics, financial metrics, um, you know, performance metrics on top of that so that you can really see the, uh, the act, you know, is activity driving revenue is the ultimate question really. So there's a new complement of revenue uh, measurement that now has to be brought into the picture. So how do you develop a revenue results mindset? You know, business and revenue impact versus actions. Uh, part of it is changing vocabulary. Um, and this is one area where I, where I encourage you to walk a mile in the uh, sales shoes for, for a bit and say, okay, how do salespeople talk about it? They don't, they don't necessarily talk about it as, you know, click-through rates or downloads or, you know, uh, impressions or CPM. Those are marketing terms that we all get. But salespeople speak in terms of, you know, what's my pipeline? How many opportunities am I working right now? What's the revenue generation uh, that I'm going to expect uh, this month, this quarter, this year? So they, they speak, they're already kind of wired in the, into the revenue uh, speak, if you will. So kind of getting, uh, getting that into your vernacular and in, maybe into your metrics would be good as well. On a very tactical level, we're, this has already kind of happened with uh, you know, Salesforce integration and things like that. Many of us have started already moving into MQLs, SALs, STLs, and sales revenue, sales revenue numbers. So getting this vernacular down into our KPIs is important. Um, yeah, pipeline integrities, sales funnel conversions, win rates, these are all just, you know, common sales vernacular. Uh, duration of sales cycles by stage, you know, are they in the value proposition stage, are they in the proposal stage, are they in the decision stage, um, things like that, you know, win-loss reports, uh, slippage, you know, have they just gone off the radar for a while, um, and then probability, uh, high probability opportunities, things like that. So. Coming up with hard and fast uh, definitions so that there's no misunderstanding about what a you know marketing qualified lead is or what a sales accepted lead is or a sales qualified lead. Getting that uh, uh, definition and vernacular kind of well circulated across your organization will help everybody be on the same page so that they uh, they're speaking the same language. Other uh, transformative roles. Hey Warren, like because you've sat on. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, because you've sat on both sides of the aisle, yes. what for people who have never, and I actually took some sales training too, and I, I do think that you get a credibility by being able to talk the talk. If you yes. haven't done that, what would you just sort of find an internal sales sponsor that is potentially sympathetic or that you have a good chemistry with and sit down, take them to lunch and ask what they're being judged on? Sure. That's always a good thing to say. You know, How are you compensated you know, without getting to their comp plan specifically, but how are you measured? Um, also, you know, there's nothing secret about this. This is all uh, very um, well documented on, you know, uh, online. So just go to Google and start searching this. So you can you can find a lot just by personal research. Um, but yeah, it doesn't ha it doesn't hurt to foster those relationships anyway with the sales team, and just they'll be glad you asked, you know. And uh, and, and there are, there are nuances to these things. I'm giving you kind of broad strokes a little bit today, but you, there are nuances to how things are measured in an organization. So you want to get the the terminology just right so that people aren't, you know, it's hard enough to do a transformative thing across a company without having the, the words and the, uh, the vernacular get in the way. So let's, you know, let's get a common uh, common language going. So that, that's a good advice. You go, go talk to the sales team and then, you know, just research this online. There is some pretty standard uh, terminology out there that you can start to embrace. The lead, I guess I'm going to put it just a hard point on the lead. Lead, uh, lead flow and lead conversion and lead quality, those things are so critical that it's probably, if you have to get one thing right, get a clear definition of what a lead is. Uh, Serious Decisions put out a, uh, a model, uh, they basically they call it a lead spectrum called BANT. And BANT stands for Budget, Authority, Need, and Purchase Timeframe. As a sales guy, you learn this very early in your career. If you're sitting in front of somebody, uh, whether they're at a cocktail party or you're in a business meeting with them, the first thing you're going to ask for is, you know, you know, not maybe not the first, but through the call, you, if you leave that meeting without knowing these things, then it, you, you're probably have a very loose 
fuzzy lead. You got to know, do they have budget? Do they have authority to spend that budget? Um, is there a burning need? You know, is there some impending, you know, product launch? Is there a big trade show they're preparing for? Are they, you know, finishing up their fiscal year? What, you know, what's the driving need behind this? Um, and then what's their purchase time frame? Is this an immediate thing or are they just kind of kicking tires and doing research and it's, they're thinking about you know, next year's planning? Those are all uh, key uh, criteria that I think uh, we in the marketing side need to understand because we can start sifting this out in, uh, in our lead capture forms and in how we engage with people with the kind of questions we ask. So there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of things we can, you know, start garnering from that. So this is a very important model to use. So you, you, here's kind of a visual of it, but you know, these are the kind of questions that, you know, if you could actually pull these out for a sales guy before he gets on his first call, you'd be his hero for sure. So, uh, you know, this once again, this just gives you a model and a framework to kind of think through. So another way, to and that's where something like the oh, go yeah. ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm just jumping in. I was going to say that's where the integration of the technology pieces come into it because if you can do a progressive lead form or a smart form that will get you those budget and authority and timelines over the course of your content engagement so that you've had five touches with them and you've pulled something new from the, the prospect every single time, then you send to the sales team, here's what it is, here's their urgent need, here's their time frame because they gave it to me in a drop-down menu. And right. you make a lot of friends that way. Exactly, exactly. And the reality is, you may not get this all in one pass. Uh, it might be part of your nurturing program to piece this together. But ultimately, this is what a sales guy needs to be successful. And the, and the organization overall, you don't want your your expensive resources chasing dead leads or leads that are year out. It's just not a good efficient use of their time. Another way that um, I look at it is basically defining it by business function and then process. So this is another way to kind of uh, operationalize this, if you will. You look at the traditional sales funnel. You look at marketing captured leads at the top, and then and then qualifying the lead process. You know, the, and then uh, creating a sales qualified lead that they can pass off to sales using the BANT model. That's all marketing function. Um, on the from a business description point of view, on the process side, there has to be a whole lead management process put in place. Like, you know, what are the what are the steps required? What is the content we're using? What are the channels we're using? All that kind of stuff has to come into play. So there's there's a function and a process element to each of these. And then when you pass it off to sales, the same thing. The sales reps, you know, if you have an inside sales team, it goes to them first. And there's further qualification uh, and opportunity management that goes on. And then ultimately, when you win the deals, there's a whole um, transfer of knowledge that has to go over to the delivery team as to, you know, even on a product side, it's like what product did they select? What, you know, what part of the world are they living in? I mean, they're at, at, even at the smallest level of any company, there's some kind of information that has to come from sales and marketing down to the delivery side so that they get the right product to the right person at the right time. So, I mean, it, you know, no matter how complex or simple your model is, there's a, a, a business function and accountability model on one side, and there's a process that everybody has to follow on the other. And the more clarity you give around this, the best. And then on the very bottom, I have a centralized data capture. So if you're capturing data throughout this uh, process, then you're really seeing what's working and what's not working. Without data, it's just kind of like, all right, we, try, we, we, we do these set of uh, processes, but are they working? You know, So uh, you know, I would say data capture is a, uh, a critical thing. And it also gives you the ability to have a single view of the customer. Ultimately, you know, oh, they came to us during a webinar, and then they downloaded our white paper, and then they talked to our sales rep. And, you know, you can go through the whole process and then find out what products they purchased and, you know, how often they've come back and that sort of thing. So we all kind of aspire to have a full single view of the customer. Alignment across the organization, once again, you know, marketing, sales, IT, everybody has a role to play in this. So, uh, you know, moving beyond the sales and marketing discussion, start now looking at, you know, IT. They're very closely tethered to this entire process, infrastructure, you know, your web, CMS, CRM you know, integration, your reporting, a lot of that is enabled or empowered by IT. Um, or more and more you'll see the trend of cloud-based solutions where marketing can just subscribe to these kind of services. But regardless, uh, it's a role at the table that you need to define. And then kind of that, you know, role and process thing, you can also start pulling out, you know, what is your interaction point with these uh, various groups and who owns what.
and then um, basically step it out into simple processes. So, you know, this is a sample of you know basically a a five-step process of you know you know send out your uh, your uh, your content across multiple channels and campaigns. You know, provide you know uh, great personalized experiences and then landing pages for those that respond. Start lead scoring those people that come in, hot, warm, or cold, and then start applying marketing automation uh, tactics to them. So you you send them a personal thank you email. You you know you personalize specific product offers to them. You send them a you know a newsletter. You know all these kind of things. And then ultimately you measure uh, everything you're doing, adjust and redo. So this is kind of a you know relatively simple model, but it, it gives you a little bit, once again, of a, a framework to think about is to how do you integrate with sales and marketing uh, as one unified team. This is a model that uh, we work on with one of our partners, uh, Sitecore, to basically take their CMS system and basically turn it into a what we call a revenue engine. So basically you can you can use what typically was a uh, you know just pure content management tool and start looking at it from a, a revenue lens and say, okay, what aspects of content management uh, complement my outbound marketing and my telesales and you know my in, my sales team uh, handoffs and then you can look at it from traffic generation, lead generation, prospecting, generating uh, new customers, engaging customers uh, that exist and cross selling and upselling them. So looking at the uh, the tool sets that you have through the le revenue lens gives you a whole new perspective on how you can use it as a uh, basically a revenue enablement tool. And that is it for me today. Any any uh, questions? You know what, Warren, I have one. Uh, um, and because we're sort of running out of a little bit of time, but I, I wanted to make sure that we make this actionable a little bit too. And one, one of the things I like to think about after sitting for an hour and hearing all this great information is what's mm -hmm. the one or two things that you would start doing tomorrow to really mm -hmm. implement a, a culture of you know transformational change in your organization, in an organization. Yeah, that's a, oh, that's a great question. I think part of it is socializing the idea. So start talking to your counterparts in sales, uh, IT, you know your C C level folks, and just start you know uh, you, particularly the sales. I'd say if you have to start anywhere, start talking to your sales counterparts and saying you know what could we do better to you know track our performance or you know how you know you could even start with casual conversations about how is how's the lead performance you know is the lead quality that yeah. I'm sending over acceptable things like that so so start informing your uh, yourself through uh, through conversations and then I'd say start start doing um, small tactical steps start tracking like maybe just take one campaign and say okay let's look at how my white paper downloads are doing you know yeah what what's what is that audience doing so you look at it in a single funnel around a single activity and you'll get a ton of learnings out of that, and, you'll be, and then you can kind of transpose that onto the next area of you know how are my webinars doing and things like that. So, you know, start with small achievable goals that you can get quick wins on and quick learnings, um, and that's also the way you'll kind of uh, foster uh, support around the organization because you can say, hey, do you realize every white paper we download generates, you know, hundred thousand dollars in sales or something like yeah. that? Yeah, that's, that's a great metric, right? So, <laughs> people love that kind of stuff, but you don't know until you look, right? So, like, yeah, start start with those you know those kind of steps. And winning supporters and and some energy around what you're trying to do, I think, is very helpful. We used to talk to some of the sales guys on a semi regular basis about what they liked to call on. Mm -hmm. So what you know what offers do you really go? Okay, good. This is a good lead or not, and create more of those because those mm -hmm. are the things that the audience is consuming and excited about. Exactly. So it's not just you know it's not just about the things that I got the most downloads or clicks on but it's the ones that generated the best conversations. Absolutely. That's it. And we all, you know, we're all busy with activities. We want those activities to be meaningful and impactful. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, putting metrics in place is great. Great. Well, thanks so much, Warren. I think we have one or two more questions, but I think we're just about at an hour. So what we'll do is we'll, anyone who has any specific questions, you can send us a note at contact at edynamic.net and we'll be sure that either Warren or myself will follow up with you to make sure that we address all your answers in in real time and also in the kind of depth that we'd like to do it. I want to thank you all for joining us today and learning how to hold ourselves accountable for creating and justifying a new revenue model in our country. 
in our company rather. I hope you learned as much as I did. This is really this is super relevant to my position as well, and and I was taking notes the whole time. So. The recording for today's webinar will be available on our website in the next three business days, and we'll also share the webcast URL with all of you via email. And again, as I said, in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to us at contact.edynamic.net for any questions you may have, or reach out to us on Twitter. It's at edynamic. Thank you, everyone, so much, and have a great day. Thanks, Megan. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lauren.